very much, uh, Tita Kit, uh, past district governor, uh, Kit Reventar, but I still love calling you Tita Kit. So nice to see you again. And of course, welcome. Uh, thank you all to uh, our participants, to our Rotarians, dear Rotarians, especially to, uh, of course, Tito Kim, President Kim Apolega. Uh, thank you for your generous uh, welcome remarks. Uh, President uh, Chris Malaiba, uh, President Matt Ignacio, President Morel Manaig, uh, and to all the Rotarians, of course, to my mom and dad. <laughs> And actually, this is the weirdest experience because uh, I'm very confident usually giving lectures around the world, except when mom and dad are the ones listening, especially if they're uh, at the front seat, no? So uh, let's see if uh, I'm going to survive this one. Um, and also, uh, this is amazing because this is so far the most generous introduction that I've ever had, no? I was introduced not just once, not just twice, but thrice. <laughs> First by Al Gray, who is our moderator for today, uh, and then next by President Kim, and then uh, by that very generous and heartwarming, uh, you know, story and uh, you know, reminiscence by uh, past DG Kid. So that's that's just so heartwarming and. I hope that you're all listening uh, in the comfort of your homes. You're all safe. And today, I hope that I'll be able to convey uh, some um, new lessons and insights. Now, now, let me share my screen. And for the next uh, 30 minutes, um, I will be sharing with you um, some reflections, some updates uh, about the current crisis that we're facing, which is COVID-19 but also the other, perhaps bigger crisis that we also have to tackle in this century, and that is climate change. And as you can notice, as you're already noticing, both of them have grave impacts to our health, but also to the health of future generations. And that is why it's so important that we, as uh, today's adults, uh, really uh, do our uh, part in order to save the planet, to save ourselves, and to save those who are yet to be born from these uh, multiple crises. But I want to start first because you all uh, started with stories. Let me share with you some pictures also because this is in a way a reunion no? of some uh, Rotarians that I know and uh, uh, Tito Kim and Tita Kit also uh, uh, referred to our young days as Rota kids. And so the first picture there, of course, you know, my mom and dad and my two siblings. That was the picture of taken shortly before the, uh, the last day of dad's presidency in Rotary Club of Calamba. So remember, there's a gala uh, on the last day, like the farewell gala. And we were wearing Filipiniana that day. And so we had that picture. So I was trying to look for pictures from Rotary's past, but this is the first thing that uh, showed up in my collection. And then below it, you will see the three of us siblings with actually two of uh, the daughters of uh, President Kim, um, Mikey and uh, Tracy. Mikey's already a doctor now. Tracy is also a dentist. So you know, three of us actually are in the health professions. Of course, my sister Lara and my brother Raymond, they're also professionals now. But those were, this is our picture from two decades ago when we were very active uh, as, again, Rota kids singing songs during Christmas parties for the Rotarians. And, you know, now it makes me wonder, how are we going to celebrate again the Rotary Christmas party with the young kids? Maybe we'll do it via Zoom and maybe we'll ask the kids to perform in front of their laptops. But it just makes you realize how beautiful life was before COVID. And now we are really, uh, you know, th these are challenges, new challenges, and it is requiring us to think out of the box and also ima reimagine, no? imagine what, what else can we do, no? How can we survive this? And maybe how can we, you know, in a way, go back to normalcy, but maybe a better normal. So hopefully we'll discuss that 
through this presentation. And then on the right, you will see 20 years later, I think this was a picture. Uh, the first one is when I also addressed the Rotary Club of Kanlubang that was recently founded, newly founded during that time. My dad was the charter president. Uh, also with uh, uh, Tito Dan Palentinos, etc. And then below, uh, the family of Tito Kim visited me at Harvard and I was able to give them a grand tour of the university. And I think that was around three degrees Celsius. No, It was really cold. You can see the ice was still there. But we braved, no? uh, Tito Kim especially and Tito Tess, braved the cold weather and the long walks around Harvard University. So, you know, this just shows, this summarizes my deep connection with Rotary, with Rotary in general, but also with the Rotary Clubs of Kalamba and Kanlubang, and of course, all the other clubs that were born after uh, the Rotary Club of Kalamba. So I'm really glad that I'm here. And of course, I wanna ensure that uh, we first remember the lives that have been already affected by this virus. So to update you, 24.5 million people already have become COVID positive since it started around January. 830,000 deaths globally as well. And still the United States is the epicenter. That was really surprising. We thought that the US is the superpower that it is, that it can uh, withstand any kind of crisis such, such as a pandemic. But as you can see, the major, you know, it's still a big portion of uh, cases globally uh, coming from the United States. Thankfully, the Philippines is still not in the top 10 or even top 20 globally. But what is the situation in the country now? Yesterday, we already passed the 200,000 mark. Today, it's already 209,000. And we have, uh, you know, around 700, uh, 71,000 uh, active cases. So, you know, they're, they're still in the hospital. They're still under quarantine. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the Philippines now is at the top of the Southeast Asian region. We've even beaten Indonesia, which is a country almost twice as big as the Philippines. But now, again, as I've said, we're the top notchers in the region. And so, you know, we can have a long discussion about what, what's happening, you know, what's wrong. Uh, and maybe in the Q&A, we can tackle that. And then, of course, no, uh, we're, what, what we're doing now is we're zooming into, no, uh, from the global to the national, now to the provincial. And as you can see, we have 2,000 800 case, uh, active cases now uh, in Laguna, almost 7,000 already since the time it started. And unfortunately, Laguna is one of the top no, uh, in terms of the provinces. And it's not surprising though, because Laguna is beside Metro Manila. And there's so much uh, mobility between Metro Manila and Laguna. A lot of our workers in Metro Manila live in Laguna, although we know that that has already, you know, Mobility, transport has already, uh, or movement has already uh, dramatically been reduced because of the lockdowns of the work from home arrangements. But still, our proximity with uh, Metro Manila makes us highly uh, susceptible uh, to getting more COVID-19 infections as compared to the rest of the country. And then, of course, I know several of us or many of us are from Kalamba. And, you know, Kalamba is a big city. Kalamba is not that far also from Met, uh, Metro Manila. And so as you can see, we have already uh, around 1,500 cases out of the, a while ago I said 7,000. So 1,500 out of 7,000. Almost one in five cases in Laguna are in Kalamba. And so uh, again, we're a met uh, metropolis. We are uh, close to Metro Manila. So it's not surprising. And that's why cities like Kalamba will need to double down uh, in trying to contain the virus and preventing further spread so that we can, uh, you know, normalize a bit our way of life in the, in the weeks and months to come. But, you know, you hear President Trump in the U.S., you even hear President Duterte in the Philippines, they say, you know, this virus, this epidemic, it's new, it's not expected. Uh, and we were caught by surprise. But the World Health Organization for so long has already predicted 
the occurrence of a pandemic such as this. The last time we had a pandemic was in 1918. And I'm, not, I'm pretty sure none of you or even your parents have been born already in 1918 when there was still no internet. The airplane has not yet been invented. Uh, and public health and medicine are still very rudimentary, very basic. No, We don't even have good vaccines during that time. But 100 years later, who would even, you know, uh, you know it's, it's not surprising, as I've said, that uh, another epidemic, another pandemic will be happening. In fact, you can see in the middle, disease X. In the WHO listing of diseases, they already included a title or a name called disease X. It's a placeholder so that we don't become complacent. We know that that disease X is coming. We just don't know from where and when and what kind. And what happened is in 2020, it's coronavirus. It started in Wuhan, China. And then now, as I've said, 24 million have already been infected. And I'm sure this is the most popular graph in social media. You've reposted it many times. Let's flatten the curve of COVID-19. And let's also raise the bar. You can see the horizontal line. No? Uh, we need to raise the bar. We need to increase the number of beds. We need to recruit more health workers. We need to make sure that when new cases arise, our healthcare system's capacity is high enough and good enough to be able to address uh, the surge of, of cases, no? But what has happened, you know? We failed to flatten the curve. We also failed to raise the bar. And what happened is the curve has hit the bar. And as you notice, in the past few weeks, there were reports of hospitals in Metro Manila already announcing they're all, they've already reached full capacity. They cannot anymore accommodate COVID patients. And then you also heard clamor from the health sector of the Philippines, the medical community, saying we need a time out so that we can let the health workers rest for a bit so we can slow down the spread of the virus and give us more time to recalibrate, to prepare more, to increase our capacity again. There's so many metaphors that have been used to describe COVID-19, and one of which is COVID-19 as a war. We are in a battle. We're fighting an unseen virus. And that rhetoric, that uh, language, has been reflected uh, not only in you know, pronouncements of government, in the speeches, but also in reality. You know, you've seen uh, military people and police being deployed uh, to, in order to keep the peace and order, but also, uh, you know, to play some roles in uh, isolation and contact tracing. And we've even heard that uh, their, uh, President Duterte is saying that once the vaccine has already been uh, made available, it's the police and the military who should be the ones injecting the vaccine, not the health workers. That's very interesting. We've never heard that uh, from before. But also, you know, I said a while ago, COVID-19 is a war. I think COVID-19 is also a mirror. And, you know, just like looking at the mirror and you see your face staring back at you, COVID-19 acted as a mirror in a sense that it reminded us, it mirrored to us all the problems of society that have already been existing even before COVID happened. So none of these problems are new. Uh, I remember... Tita Kit mentioned a while ago, climate change is not new. We've been talking about all these problems. They are not novel issues. Indeed, they're not. And so, you know, these problems related to transport, these, you know, problems related to cramped prisons, all of these are old problems. And COVID-19 just serves as a mirror to remind us of all these problems and even exacerbated all these challenges. No? Now they're more difficult to address. And in COVID-19, I think I, I like this metaphor. COVID-19 is, is, is a portal. It's a door. It's a door from the old world to the new world. And as you can see here, you know, even this convening, this meeting that we're having, who would even imagine six months ago that the Rotary Clubs of Calamba, Metro Calamba, Calamba City, and Kalubang, and all the other partners will be having an online meeting? That was not on the table before. 
you always want to go to, well, I'm not sure where do you hold your meetings al uh, already, but when I was a Rota kid, we often go to Riverview, remember? And Riverview now has become a quarantine facility. Who would even imagine, right? Uh, so there's so many new things happening already, even education. Now remote learning has become the norm, work from home arrangements. And of course, who would even imagine that EDSA will be as clear as the one that you see in the picture? That was not thinkable or imaginable before, but it shows to us that these things can happen. And there's a lot of talk about social distancing, and I hope that you will uh, continue to be doing social distancing in the weeks and months to come. Um, and, but the real social distancing is this, you know, the distancing and the widening of the distance between the rich and the poor, between the have-nots and, and those who have. And, you know, perhaps this group, our group of Rotarians, we are very privileged. Uh, we, can, we can work from home. Uh, we stay at home. Our children can go to school remotely. Uh, we have access to food and water and all the other resources. We've not maybe uh, lost jobs or uh, for the entrepreneurs, you still have your uh, businesses, maybe less income these days uh, and presenting new challenges. But the poor have no option. They've lost the jobs. They don't ha even have the luxury of social distancing because they live in squatter squatters areas like this. And so, COVID-19, again, just exacerbated or worsened the social distancing that already exists before. And then we're seeing now, uh, not just in the Philippines, but around the world. No? I wrote there from lockdown to breakdown. And, you know, because of, you know, we've seen all the lockdowns, the quarantines, the Philippines actually has the longest lockdown in the world. And still, we were not able to flatten the curve, which is really fascinating. But also, we're seeing some um, manifestations of social breakdown. If you remember, and if you're uh, looking at, you know, seeing it in the news, uh, you know, the, the, in the United States, there's a lot, there are a lot of protests happening. Black Lives Matter, as they say, you know, because the COVID-19 is worsening the racial injustices that have been affecting the, uni the, the United States for so long. And then here in the Philippines, you also have the breakdown of society, the breakdown of freedom of speech, of democracy. And of course, you know, um, uh, we might have different political persuasions uh, in our group. But in general, what's, what, we're happening now, happen, what is happening now is, um, you know, even social media is now being weaponized. Uh, fake news is going around. So there's so many problems that are happening in the middle of the pandemic, okay? So we all talk about the new normal, but actually I don't like the term new normal because it somehow connotes that there was an old normal, but the old was not normal. This is not normal. An EDSA with traffic that, you know, gives you a travel time of four hours that could have been done for 30 minutes, that wasn't normal. And so it's really a shift from abnormal to normal that we want to see, you know, in, in this age of COVID-19 and, af and, and after this one. And then there's also a lot of uh, discussion and, um, you know, uh, fuzz about mass testing. We need to test more people. We need to be, give free testing to people for COVID-19. But for me, I think the real mass testing is the mass testing of leadership. Leaders are now being tested on whether they will perform well or they will perform poorly. If they are committed to the needs of the people or they will only think about their own personal interests. So I will not rate these leaders, and I'm sure this is just a sampling, there, there are much more. No? But this is really a time to test these leaders and to see you know, who are the ones that we should follow and emulate. Who are the ones who, should, who we should vote out in the upcoming elections, whether in the U.S., because they're having elections in a few months, or in the Philippines, we're having elections in less than two years. So mass testing of leadership, that's COVID-19. 
So, I've talked about the first crisis, which is COVID-19. And as you remember in the title, there's also another crisis that we should be paying attention to. And this is the issue of climate change, which I've been working on for nearly a decade. Uh, even my doctoral thesis focused on climate change. And you hear these reports, you know, we only have, actually it's now 10 years remaining. We only have 10 years remaining to prevent catastrophic climate change. And when we say catastrophic climate change, you have, you know, continuous heating of the planet. A lot of natural disasters happening. And, you know, you, and you see a lot of young people like Greta Thunberg uh, really expressing their anger at the world's leaders, at the world's adults for their slow pace of action. So that is what animated my career as a medical doctor. You will see me there in front of the UP College of Medicine with a poster saying, climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. But I think also addressing climate change, as you can see on your right, could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. If we address it, we will generate a lot of health benefits for ourselves and for future generations. We can also have a lot of green jobs. We can also, again, make the environment cleaner, the air, the water, for the future generation, and also uh, even for other creatures, no? for animals and plants alike. So I'm not going to detail, but I'm showing to you, if you're afraid of the numbers of COVID-19, we should also be afraid of the numbers that are coming from climate change. No? So from 2030 to 2050, around 250,000 deaths annually due to climate change. And this is a conservative estimate because it's hard to quantify all these potential uh, diseases until they already began happening. And as you can see here, and I will not go into detail, maybe this is too technical, but as you will see, there's so many ways by which climate change affects human health. No? From storms, bagyo, drought, tag-init, no? flooding, uh, uh, baha. And when all of these happen, there will be impacts on health, whether it's heart attacks because of intense heat, to dengue and malaria, infectious diseases, or undernutrition, uh, and then even mental illness. So now we're starting to you know, observe that because of intense heat, because of natural disasters, people are also uh, facing a lot of mental distress and disorder, like post-traumatic stress disorder, etc. So we know when climate change um, events happen, like this one, no? uh, this was in 2013, Typhoon Yolanda in Tacloban. It's not just your hospitals and schools and houses and buildings and food systems, agricultural lands, uh, water systems. All systems are affected, if not destroyed. And as I said a while ago, uh, you know, your infectious diseases are also becoming affected by climate change. For instance, in 2019, last year, dengue is a tropical disease. So it only shows up in places like the Philippines. But now there are, we are reporting that dengue and other tropical diseases are also showing up in places like Europe, which is not a tropical region. Okay? And then here you will see, because we are an archipelagic country, we have more than 7,000 islands. We are seeing the fastest rate of sea level rise. So our beaches, our coastal communities, they're starting to get flooded, inundated because of sea level rise. And the level of the sea is rising because the ice caps in the Arctic are melting, again, because of climate change, because of global warming. So I talked a while ago about the coronavirus, and then I talk about climate change. Maybe you're asking, are they linked? Are they connected? So these are my, the, my next slides will tackle that question. So first, we know that a warming planet will make viruses, infectious diseases, more likely to spread. More, more outbreaks are expected, again, in a warming planet. And it's worsened because we also consume a lot of wildlife, meat products, for example. We use wildlife for clothing, for even med medicine. You know? uh, traditional Chinese medicine, for example, uses a lot of you know, animals 
uh, for pets and for food. And we know the origins of of COVID-19. It came from a market in China. When that when a human being touched an animal, okay, and the virus jumped from an animal to a human being. So it can happen again if we will not change many of our practices in the way we deal with animals, for example. And we know that because of globalization, a virus can spread around the world of weeks or months. Yes, Maybe the host can try to mute. So another thing is that COVID-19 and climate change are showing to us that our healthcare systems are not ready, totally not ready for for any kind of situation, disaster, a virus, uh, or long-term climate change. Okay, and so. Especially us, no? we're from Laguna, we're from Kalamba. Maybe we should start thinking, is the health system of our province ready for these long-term challenges? Okay? And, you know, because Laguna is close to Manila, we always think, oh, if we need healthcare, we can easily go to Metro Manila. And then pan this pandemic has happened, and now the borders are closed, or there's limited mobility between Metro Manila and Laguna. And so, are our, hospital, are our hospitals ready for these challenges? And I did some quick calculations. This is just very rapid. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, a much better uh, investigation can be done. But just by counting the number of hospitals, and I want to make sure we're clear, it's not just hospitals that we should be looking at. We should look at the health centers. And we should even look at, health preve uh, promotion and disease prevention. Because if we, we only focus on hospitals, that's too late. When patients show up in the emergency room, that's too late. We should make sure that people don't reach the emergency room. Okay? Through good uh, high, lit high health literacy, for example, healthy behaviors, etc. But just looking at the hospital, you will see, I'm not sure if we have colleagues here who come from District 3, San Pablo, they only have eight hospitals for their population of 550,000. And so if you will see the ratio, other, other districts have around one hospital for around 40,000 people. But this, this District 3, you know, uh, needs to accommodate 70,000 know, people just in one hospital. You know? Just one hospital can, can the catchment area is around 70,000. And I know in Kalamba, I think there was, there's, we, we're building another hospital, uh, uh, the partnership between the city government and uh, a private uh, company. So that's, that's good news. We have another facility, but maybe at, for the entire province, we need to think of how can we strengthen the health system, not just the hospitals. We're not even counting it. Do we have enough doctors and nurses and other health workers? And I'm sure we're all aware that uh, the Philippines has a universal healthcare law. The spirit of the universal healthcare law is that every Filipino will have access to healthcare and they don't need to sell their carabao or to make their child stop going to school in order to spend for healthcare. That is the vision of UHC. But what is happening now? One, PhilHealth is, has announced a few weeks ago that they will delay the implementation of universal health care because of COVID, because they're not collecting enough money from people. No one is paying their premiums. Okay? But there is another issue that has erupted in the past two weeks, corruption in pill health. Okay? So it's not just they're not collecting enough money, but there are also alleged corruption happening for the remaining money that exists. And so how can we achieve universal health care if your money is not enough and the remaining money is being stolen? Another issue around COVID and climate change is, I'm sure you've seen in the news, uh, Metro Manila has bluer skies 
and fresher air because of COVID. Cars have stopped driving. Factories have stopped operating. Okay? Even in China, the level of air pollution has gone down dramatically. So you can see that in the graph. Oh, the orange color has disappeared dramatically because of the lockdowns. Even there, there's even fake news that because of uh, COVID-19, the animals have been celebrating. Uh, some dolphins have showed up in the canals of Venice. And if you remember, there was even a video of an ostrich running around in Quezon City two weeks ago. So there's a lot of uh, stories about uh, animals reclaiming what, the, what was stolen from them by, by human beings. But this is the reality. Now that the countries are reopening, now that economies, businesses, cities are reopening, all the levels of pollution that we had before are just coming back. So as you can see, pollution has gone down, but now they're all coming back. They're all surging back. And so this is temporary. This is short-lived. And I think this is premature celebration. We need to start thinking, how can we make sure that if we are going to reduce pollution and if we are going to prevent climate change, we sustain it and we don't go back to the old normal that we were talking about a while ago. Another problem that is now emerging, PPE pollution, plastic pollution, masks, uh, single-use masks, used left and right. And of course, we, we Filipinos don't know how to dispose of our waste properly. Unfortunately, despite the Philippines having one of the best solid waste management laws in the world, that is not very well implemented. And so we might be able to fight COVID-19, but we are creating a new problem of environmental pollution if we don't uh, take into account the environment right now. And this is also the scary story. When COVID-19 showed up, it didn't mean that climate change stopped. Okay? It's still happening. It's still going to happen. Now we are seeing typhoons in the Philippines. And we expect more typhoons to happen in the months to come because it's typhoon season. But in other parts of the world, they have heat waves in Europe. Okay. Locus crisis. So uh, uh, what's, what's locus? Tipaklong uh, ba? You know, they are in, infesting you know, their agricultural lands. Hurricanes, I think it was it's yesterday or two days ago when a hurricane has hit Texas. And then by the time January comes, uh, there will be bushfires again in Australia, destroying their forests and creating more air pollution. So again, climate change has not stopped while COVID-19 is happening as well. And this is what's going to happen. When a natural disaster happens, our poor Filipinos are divided or are facing a dilemma. Do I stay at home so I protect myself from COVID, but, I will, but my house will get flooded and my roof will be blown away by the strong wind? Or do I move to the evacuation center so I don't get hit by the flying roof or I don't get uh, flooded, but I probably will get COVID because the social distancing is already violated in these cramped classrooms. So, you know, remember, we need to flatten the curve of COVID-19. But there is also another curve that we need to flatten, and that is the curve of our ecological footprint, our environmental footprint, our carbon emissions. And remember, the healthcare system's capacity can be increased, can be adjusted, can be changed. You get more ICU beds, you recruit more health workers. But the Earth's capacity is unchangeable and it's non-negotiable. We cannot move that bar. We cannot raise the bar. So the only chance that we have is that we adjust our actions so that we don't hit the bar of the Earth, of the environment. Because if not, and you know, in the news there's so many discussion about, uh, you know, is the, co is the first wave of COVID-19 over? Are we already on the second wave? No? So as you can see, the small waves there. 
But actually, there's a much bigger, not even wave, it's a tsunami of climate change that we can anticipate if we delay action now. So I'm going to the last part of my presentation to summarize all the lessons that we learned. And when I was studying as a medical doctor, I already knew that I will not be only treating patients. I will not be sitting in the clinic waiting for the patient to show up to give the medicine. Okay? Because, because of this, because of this reality, that how is health produced? We often think of health as the hospital and the health center and the doctor and the nurse and the medicine and the x-ray machine. But actually, as you can see that here, the bulk of health, around 55%, come from social and environmental factors. Is the air clean, breathable? Is the water drinkable? Are our roads uh, safe uh, to walk on? Are, you know, is, are, you know what's, what's the food environment? Do we have healthy food options, uh, et cetera? 20% come from behavioral factors. Do people smoke? Do they exercise? Do they um, observe uh, uh, moderate uh, drinking uh, behaviors, et cetera? So that's more than half of the pie, of this pie, comprising the social, the environmental, and the behavioral factors. Medicine, that's only a very small portion of our health, of our population's health. And that's why when I became a doctor, I also decided, you know, I will tackle environmental issues. I will work with communities. I will work with policymakers. I cannot be sitting comfortably in the clinic waiting for the patient to show up. And because our patients in the 21st century are not just any more people, but also the planet, people and planet. And that is why, and a while ago, uh, Alan mentioned the term planetary health. This is the new concept. Before, it's called public health. We only focus on the health of people. But now, we have to tackle in an integrated way the health of both people and the planet. As they say, it takes two to tango. So you need healthy people and you need a healthy planet so that we can all be, uh, live in harmony. And to simplify, planetary health for me is agham ng lahat. L is lupa. A is araw. H, hangin at hayo. A, ako. T, tubig at tao. So that's an acronym, lahat. Lahat ay magkaugnay, sabi nga ni Joey Ayala sa kanta. Okay? So planetary health, agham ng lahat. And ito yung dream ko. This is my dream, no? And, you know, as you know, I came from the U.S., um, in the U.S., they have uh, this place in California, Silicon Valley, the epicenter of technological innovation. But for me, I came back to the Philippines because I believe the Philippines can be the Silicon Islands, not Valley, Silicon Islands of planetary health. We can show the world how we can take care of ourselves and take care uh, of the planet, of Mother Earth, at the same time. And this is a, not a new idea, okay? If you go to the indigenous communities, you know, Ifugao or even in Africa or even in, you know, the Native American Indians, they would say that the health of people and health of the planet are deeply intertwined. According to Chief Seattle, the earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. And that is why um, this is also a very new book, The Good Ancestor. This is an invitation for us to become good ancestors. How can we be good ancestors to our grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, the grandchildren of our grandchildren who are not born yet? And so our decisions now will be affecting the next generation 100 years from now. And we don't want that generation to look back to history and say, oh, the Rotarians of 2020, they were not good ancestors to us. They were involved in unhealthy practices. They have, 
destroyed the planet and made it less habitable for us. So it is an invitation to stop short-term short-termism and to adopt long-term thinking. And this is challenging because you know, as we know, uh, we elect our officials in Rotary on an annual basis. So our plans are always annualized. We elect our officials every three years or every six years. There's so much short-termism around. And so this is an invitation to think, how can we plan for the next 10, 20, or 50 years? How can we make sure that our, our, our actions will not jeopardize the, well, the health and the well-being? of the next generation that we will that we have not that we're not seeing it and perhaps we will never meet that is a very radical way of thinking how to become a good ancestor and so we're all business people here a lot of us in rotary and right now during the time of covid-19 and climate change there's so much talk about the role the future role of business one article, according to the dean of the Harvard School of Public Health, is it time for businesses to hire chief public health officers? You know, we have a CEO, we have a chief operating officer, we have a chief innovation officer, chief technological officer. We don't have a chief health officer in our companies. We don't have a health strategy. We only have, a, you know, an environmental strategy. We have a business strategy. We don't have a health strategy. And according to the article uh, below, COVID-19 is a dress rehearsal for entrepreneurs for long-term climate change, okay? So how are, we go how are we doing now? What are we doing now? I wanna hear from the Rotarians maybe later during the Q&A. And I have a Harvard professor who, uh, who came up with this concept, no? How can we build a culture of health in business? And there are four basic components, one, Think of your employees, employee health. And this is not just about having, you know, your employees having health insurance or, you know, uh, educating your health, your employees. Are they happy in the workplace? Do they feel secure? Are they are, do they feel healthy? Uh, do you have routine exercise or, you know, even uh, your office arrangement, the seats, the tables, you know? Um, do they, are they able to, uh, you know, move within the office instead of sitting on their desk from eight to five? Are we making our workplaces tobacco-free, smoke-free workplaces? So there's so much that we can do just for our employees alone. The next component is consumer health. So if you are, if you own a factory, you produce products for your consumers, if you sell land, you sell land to your, uh, you know, clients uh, as a real estate broker, uh, et cetera, et cetera. How are we making sure that the products and services that we sell to our consumers are healthy for their own health and for their families? Community health. And I think this is something that Rotary as a club can also make a difference. And I know you hold medical missions, you hold surgical missions. Now is the time to go beyond these annual medical missions and surgical missions. How can we invest in health systems in our communities, not just in the hospitals, not just in the healthcare facilities and healthcare centers, but in health education of our children in schools, um, you know, in, in creating uh, smoke-free environments, for example. Uh, maybe creating um, markets for healthy food uh, and, and uh, sustainably produced foods. So there's so much that we can do as companies for our communities. And finally, environmental health. I know that the Rotary Club also has an environmental uh, uh, committee or before I remember, you have vocational service, you have public service, you have you know, these uh, different... Uh, you know, com committees, and then now you have environment as well. That is amazing. And now how can we go beyond annual tree plantings and making sure that the businesses of Rotarians are not contributing to climate change and to environmental pollution? That is a big question. If you own a factory, you own a company, how are we minimizing the waste and the pollution that we generate? 
So we want to be part of the green and healthy recovery. After COVID, what we want is that the future is both green and both and healthy at the, at the same time. We want to be part of this story. We don't want to be, you know, the bad apples. Oh, this company, uh, you know, stayed with, you know, the old norma. Uh, they stuck with their old business practices that pollute the air, that pollute the waters, and that make people unhealthy. We don't want to be that business after COVID-19 is finished. And what we need, so there's so many discussion about PPEs, no? PPE being, you know, there's a PPE shortage. Our health workers are dying, are getting infected because there's not enough masks, there's not enough PPE. But I think the real PPE that we need is what I call the people and planet oriented economy or PPE. That's also another PPE. And right now, our economy is really based on greed, based on, you know, amassing wealth. You know, I think to yesterday, they just announced that Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, has breached the 200 billion mark. He is the first billionaire in the history of the world who has a net worth of 200 billion dollars. While we know that 99% of the world's planet, of the, of the world's population, do not even have enough income, okay, for, for their families, for their communities. So, you know, huge inequality in income alone. So what we need is an economy that serves people and that protects the planet. And this is a, pro, uh, a model that was, uh, you know, uh, there's a book called, another book, so a while ago, it's the, uh, A Good Ancestor. And actually, his wife wrote another book, which is entitled The Donut Economy. And as you can see here, it looks like a donut. We need a, an economy that stays within the green donut. A, an economy that does not go below the donut, okay? Below the social foundation. So we want an economy that provides the food, the water, the health, education, women empowerment, housing, political voice, peace and justice. We need an economy that meets the social foundation. But we also need an economy that does not overshoot or go beyond the ecological ceiling, the planetary boundaries. We don't want an economy that, you know, kills the ocean or uses a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus for agriculture, no, through artificial fertilizers. We don't want biodiversity loss, no, uh, ex the extinction of, of animals and, and wildlife. We don't want high levels of air pollution. So how can we stick to that donut economy in between? And I think that really the message is balance. In the 21st century, we need a planet, a world of balance. So this is your theme. Rotary opens opportunities. And indeed, there is a new opportunity really for Rotary to be transformational in the time of COVID and climate. And if you notice, they're both circles. The donut economy and Rotary, the Rotary logo, as you can see, there is a grand opportunity for Rotary. And I hope you can convey this to all the chapters and all the clubs and even the Rotary International. You know, you've, we've beaten polio. Yesterday, the WHO announced that Africa is now free of polio. And we know that Rotary contributed a lot to polio elimination globally. So now, what's our next polio? And I think it should be COVID and it should be climate change. So together, let's advance the health of both people and planet. Thank you for listening and looking forward to our conversation.